that uh, is reality of the past, that really was, is something which is actually constituted by the historian. The past that the historian refers to is something constituted by the historian. The facts that historians refer to are things which historians constitute as historical facts. It's not simply there as historical fact. Uh, so the story that the historian tells is not something which again is a story of the past as it really happened, but it is a past that is in some sense constructed by the historian. <clears throat> and this raised the question of uh, two or three general questions, which is what do we mean by saying that you construct? What do you mean by saying you constitute? What is this reality of the past that the historian constitutes? What is the process through which this happens? Uh, the, to say it, the historian constitutes is too general a statement. Can we spell it out? Can we understand? If we are saying that his, the past is not simply there, but we as observers, as historians, as uh, um, people who wish to understand history, want to understand that past, then what is this process of understanding? If the story that the historian writes is the product of an understanding of the past, then we need to know the process through which this understanding happens. So if this is a process of comprehending the past, uh, un making sense of the past, we need to understand what making sense really means, what the understanding really means, what uh, comprehension of the past really means, uh, what is the act through which comprehension happens. And if we are trying to think through our arguments about comprehension, about understanding, about cognition, about making sense of the past through which the past comes to us as history, then in some sense um, we uh, need to develop our argument beyond this point to understand the processes through which all this happens. Uh, today I'll go on from this uh, uh, elementary um, critique of positivism that we started with last time to develop what has come to be known as the na debate around the narrativist thesis. That is uh, the argument that history is a narrative. Uh, we told, uh, we t uh, talked of how the, the past is a story, the history is a story that the historian tells about the past. If it is a story, how do we construct that story? That's the concrete issue. How do we conceptualize our act of construction? How do we think about the, the acts which historian is involved in, the acts the historians are involved in, in the act of that construction, in the act of that understanding, making sense, return to the past, grasping the past in a certain sense. Uh, the other issue, of course, is um, if the past is a construct of the historian, and this is something which bothers uh, all students of history, then what is the distinction between history and fiction? Uh, how does history uh, not become fiction? It is everything a fabrication? If we are talking about construction, what's the distinction between fabrication, construction, fiction? And uh, uh, we will go on, today I'll go on to discuss some of these issues through a discussion of uh, three critical interventions in the in this uh, uh, act of understanding of the act of the historian, the, the process through which historian grasps the past, understands the past. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Louis Mink, whose book I've referred to, Historical Understanding, uh, four or five essays I've referred to. Um, uh, he was one of the earliest to develop the argument about, uh, develop an argument about what history really is, what the act of writing history is really. Uh, then I'll go on to discuss uh, Hayden White, who has been one of the most influential writers and thinkers on uh, history. Um, so all his books, I've referred to two of them, I've referred to some essays in that, but ideally over time you should try and read as many of those essays. He's had a powerful influence in not, not only the writing of history, but literary criticism, aesthetics, um, critical anthropology today, in all these things you will inevitably come across Hayden White as a standard footnote which appears over and over time, as if to refer to Hayden White is to authenticate that you are um, uh, keeping up with the time, you know, that, that, that his interventions have shifted the terrain of discussion. And finally I'll refer to uh, talk about in some detail about Paul Ricker, whose three volumes, or I've referred to two volumes out of it, I don't suggest that everyone reads it, 
<coughs> it's a very very important uh, book uh, i think he's one of the those philosophers who is consistently and persistently engaged with problems of uh, understanding uh, within uh, 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 within social sciences as a whole and his book hermeneutics and the social sciences the series of essays which are there i'm not referred to and maybe i refer to one uh, um uh, text from that one article from that those of you who are interested in understanding the philosophical premises of uh, um uh philosophical premises of uh, um social science thinking within social science ought to uh, read some of the essays in um, paul ricker's um hermeneutics and the social sciences uh, a series of essays which actually uh, helps you think how the uh, how different philosophical traditions have in some way structured our thinking within social sciences a time and um, time and narrative uh, is uh, uh, these three volumes are the deepest reflections on the act of writing history um and he draws on a whole range of ideas conceptual long history from aristotle downwards to now in order to think through the argument about narrative and time so i'll try and summarize his arguments and raise some issues there so uh, the way i'll proceed is in a, uh, to give some uh, of the critical ideas of these people and then engage with some of those ideas to see how do we relate to those ideas so i begin with louis mink uh, on his arguments about uh, narrative and history <coughs> um as i said mink developed the thesis much before uh, hayden white does and um paul ricker right and therefore many of the arguments that emerge now uh, are ideas which in a sense are taken for granted within the historic uh, within the critical historical i shouldn't say historical um uh profession because uh, the craft of writing history or conception of history is so varied and that's one of the arguments that we engage, uh, need to um relate to that is um i mentioned last time that uh, uh, within science also it is recognized now that shifts in paradigm redefine knowledge about science that it is not new facts discovery of new facts which lead to the constitution of new scientific knowledge but it is critically the shift within the framework of understanding in the paradigm the way you make sense of those facts the new ideas about making sense of science which leads to a shift in knowledge within science and that is equally true within history in a certain sense but does it mean that there is a um displacement of one paradigm by another in science that displacement happens in social sciences in history it does not necessarily happen a new mode of thinking does not completely displace others positivist thinking continues to be as power, not as powerful fairly powerful even today so we cannot just look at some of the avant-garde critical historians working at the cutting edge and then assume that everyone thinks like that <clears throat> that would be um um an arrogant assumption on the part of those who think critically because there is a, uh, the historical the the historical consciousness of the people in uh, popular consciousness public consciousness is defined by a variety of forms of knowledge about it from myth to stories to folklore to the popular tracts uh, distributed as history in the uh, in the bazaars and the streets all that defines the consciousness of history within society and those are written very often in a completely different mode in within the for instance the, the mythic histories draw upon mythic modes in order to structure it in a way which relates at one level to the profession of the historians their rhetoric their uh, language their modes their mode of footnoting authentication forms uh, of uh, claims to truth all that but structure it uh, also by drawing upon mythic tropes tropes within the mythic tradition in order to build a story which appears familiar to people which appears believable to people so but what it do, does so uh, the mythic stories or mythic narratives are not necessarily displaced by scientific history or critical history they continue to be popular and if they are popular we need to understand them but this point itself implies that we need to understand the frames and the paradigms within which knowledge is produced if one is arguing that mythic stories are very powerful and important in constituting the historical consciousness of people and that is why for instance um when the ram janam bhoomi thing happened or the communal propaganda happens there are lots of rumors and stories which are spread why do people believe them they believe them because they appear believable that is a history produced in a particular structure and a mode 
which is popularized, which is accepted as history very often. But it's not always fully accepted. Uh, there's a famous book written by you know, Paul Vane uh, called uh, Do Greeks Believe in Their Myths? And he argues, Vane, who is again a French historian, who's written extensively on, uh, on the theories of history. He's uh, worked on ancient um, uh, Greece, uh, uh, a historian of ancient Greece, but written extensively on, uh, on history itself. Now he argues that to believe in the myth is not not to believe in scientific history. Most of us believe in several, uh, relate to different modes of knowledge. We believe uh, in a particular narrative which scientific, so-called objective historians give us. But at the same time, that does not displace our, completely displace our belief in possibly a religious narrative or a mythic narrative or other kinds of structures which become also part of it. So within our mind we negotiate, we, uh, there is a battle between different levels and in different points of time different kinds of way, ways of nar narration of the past come into effect or our belief in different ways of narration is there. So they, they, we, that is why we may um, operate in one way in one situation, uh, in another way in another situation. So uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that different paradigms are not necessarily displaced by the emergence of a new paradigm within history. Uh, so what happens is a conflict of paradigms, a battle for different notions of truth, a battle for different ways of returning to the past and making sense of that past. And what is that making sense is something I'll try to talk about today. Mink argues uh, that in historical thinking, um, conclu conclusions that um, uh, conclusions within history are non-detachable and non, uh, uh, they are essentially ingredient. That is, they, conclusions cannot be separated from the facts. Conclusions that cannot be separated from the material or the evidence or the fact that you produce. It is not as if historians first produce the facts and then they draw out certain conclusions. It is not as if you produce certain propositions like scientists do, that these are the propositions, then you test those propositions, then you come to a conclusion. Um, Hayden White was one of the first to argue that narrative is a, is a, that a, uh, within the historical narrative, the fact and the conclusion come together. Conclusions are ingredient elements, that is they are constitutive elements of the narrative themselves. They do not come at the end. In a certain sense, conclusions which come at the end when historians write a full chapter and then they have a conclusion, that's usually a repetition. That is something which has already been argued out ten times over, but you are expected within a framework of knowledge and a narrative that you know you must draw out your conclusions, so people draw out those conclusions. But they have already drawn it out ten times over. Therefore, very often they are tired uh, writing that conclusion very often again. Those who write their MPhil theses and PhDs would know this, that by the time you come to the conclusion, you feel well, I've said everything. Why do you feel I've said everything? Because you cannot make an argument without continuously making a conclusion. So the facts do not really make sense if they are outside the narrative. The facts become part of the narrative and the conclusions are part of that narrative. <coughs> the conclusion is the historical argument. There is no argument or fact independent of conclusion. <coughs> uh, he argues from this that propositional conclusions are impossible within history. That pro propositional conclusions, which is the way science, natural science is very often uh, right, now propositional conclusions are impossible within history. If somebody begins by writing, I am uh, making four propositions, uh, then uh, you can still uh, accept that as a narrative style, but it is not as if he's actually um, uh, had those propositions and then gone around uh, looking for the facts and then written about it to test those propositions. That may be a, simply a writing style. You have come to the conclusions, you have made the argument, but then you write in a way where you are putting forward three or four propositions and then arguing it through. But generally that is not the way historians write. You are telling a story. You're developing an argument through that story. And in that way you develop the argument, your conclusions are being developed through the chapters, through the sections, through the pages, through the unfolding of that story. So the story is the conclusion. The narrative is the conclusion. 
the argument is the conclusion. <coughs> this is an important point in the sense that <coughs> um, it tells us the power of the narrative itself. What narrative is? That narrative is here producing is actually the basis of um, it's the basis of uh, developing your truth claim. It is through the narrative that you are making a truth claim or an argument or are developing a conclusion. He goes on to argue <coughs> that narrative itself, and that's the second point I would like to emphasize, that narrative is a cognitive instrument. And there's an essay on narrative as a cognitive instrument where he develops this at length. That narrative is not something which you develop a story is not something you write. The story within history is not something you write after you have come to your conclusion. That is, it's not as if you have come, uh, you have developed your arguments, you have made your conclusion, then you decide that I need to narrativize it. That's not how history, meaning in history develops. If you cannot narrativize, there is no argument. That is, the fact that you select as important, the facts you see as historically significant, the facts which become part of your story or a narrative or your history that you write, those facts are selected within the structure of a narrative. They make sense within that narrative. If they make sense within that narrative, narrativization itself is an act of cognition, of comprehension, of making sense, of understanding. Therefore, what is uh, what might happen is that you constantly, as you write, and those of you who have done research earlier and are going on to do research will see this, when you are um, reading, uh, reading records, re uh, reading, looking through evidence and records, at each point as you read, you are trying to make sense. And trying to make sense there means you are trying to plot it within a narrative. And as you are plotting it in a narrative, a meaning emerges. If you can't plot, the records make no sense. How, on what basis, from thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, you select a few facts. They make sense to you, not because there is truth embedded in them, not because there is uh, the facts of the past are embedded only on those facts that you choose as significant historical evidence. It is because you are attributing, we are attributing significance to those historical elements, those historical evidence, and seeing those as significant and important. And that seeing that discovery of the significance is the act of comprehension, but that is the act of narrativization. We are constantly make, uh, developing small quasi-narratives, small narratives, not larger arguments, small narratives, you know, this is not making sense. Uh, oh, suddenly you find a link between one fact and another. Suddenly something falls in place and you discover and history, in writing history, that's the excitement. Suddenly you feel that you have got it. Some argument is emerging here. Something is emerging as comprehensible. You couldn't make sense of things. Suddenly it is. That is because you have discovered a way of plotting that as a story. And once you get that, then a lot of other facts make sense to you as part of that narrative. Anything which doesn't fall within that narrative, cannot be comprehended within that narrative, is excluded from your story. So you are not being manipulated or orchestrating evidence in a manipulative way when you are excluding certain things. It is the natural, normal act of writing. Now, there is a difference between this and deliberate erasure. Uh, erasures which emerge from a structure of paradigm. Suppose you are uh, thinking through patriarchal, masculinist ideas. Certain things, the questions even don't come to you. The fact that you need to look at how the, what the women felt or experienced um, is not something that a lot of historians even could think of as a relevant question. Now, when the paradigm shift takes place, certain questions become important to you, and as they become important to you, you grapple with them, negotiate them, and pose them in the act of uh, looking through the material, through the records, and in the act of trying to understand. And once those questions are posed, different, the same facts begin to make different sense. Not that everyone who poses the question will come up with the same argument or the same narrative. But certain possible questions, a set of new questions can open up the possibility of an alternative narrative. 
Within that, there may be variations in the way I plot my argument, in the way somebody else plots the argument. And there may be diametrically opposed conclusions which emerge because we do it within different frames of reference. Um, but the point uh, that I'm trying to say, it is that act of making sense, that act of making sense that we are talking about is the act of narrativization. And it is not the final narrative which is produced, but every moment of research and every moment of uh, um, see, uh, every, uh, the, the act of even going through an index of sources is an act of constantly making a narrative, uh, you know, uh, thinking through a narrative. You see 20 documents uh, listed, which uh, uh, half a line is given on them, and suddenly a story begins. So you begin to look for those even within the index. Uh, and therefore, uh, your relationship to the index itself gets structured by the narrative you're already developing. That may be subverted, as we'll come to, uh, in the, uh, that, that may be subverted, it may break down, you may uh, throw away your narrative, and that's how the narratives constantly change, even as you do research. If you refuse to change, then you are forcing a narrative onto the material where it is, uh, that material is actually crying out for an alternative explanation. And then there is a tension between the facts you produce and the arguments you develop. And that inner tension needs to be uh, looked at, analyzed, uh, as part of critical thinking, that whether the argument or the narrative is produced, uh, that you produce, is something which flows from or is, has a tension with the material that you are producing as historical evidence. So narrative, therefore, is a cognitive instrument. That's the wise argument. That's something which um, Paul Ricker, to, uh, you know, I've given out this reader, um, a narrative reader, which uh, has uh, a whole range of essays uh, on the narrative, different kinds of arguments about the narrative and how um, narratives uh, are, uh, how, in what form and in what sense narratives produce um, uh, meaning. The narrative reader is there with Shubhu. Uh, I have I've put out two sets there. One is a selection of six or seven essays. Um, those who don't want the whole book uh, can take Mink's essays, Hayden White's essays and some other essays are there. And those who are interested in the entire volume, which has got about 35 essays on this entire debate, uh, in a, uh, can take the uh, other book. Um, but um, uh, I've also um, left um, the, uh, Louis Mink's book, as well as Paul Ricker's book, and a set of other essays by Hidden White, uh, um, which is there with Shubo. <coughs> uh, third, Mink argues, that comprehension that we are talking about, historical comprehension, is the act of seeing together things and events which were not experienced together. That experience of the past, when, you, uh, when events happen in society, uh, then they come, they follow, there is a chronological flow of that. It follows a clock time. And you experience it, experience those events and that reality in seriatim, over time, as uh, coming in sequence, sequentially. So the experience of a time, the time that you experience, the events when you experience, is ex experience sequentially. But when you write about it post facto, as a historian later on, then you re rework that experience into a narrative, which is then connecting different experiences which were experienced uh, experienced sequentially into a new structure which has meaning within your narrative. So you are in, in a sense uh, attributing a coherence, a certain type of coherence to the events of the past. And attribution of that coherence, uh, discovery of that coherence uh, is the product of your narrativization, is the act of narrativization. It is in this sense the act of narrativization becomes an act of seeing together things which have happened separately or in seriatim or sequentially. So experiences in this argument is something which is not narrativized, which, is, which comes in a certain sense um, sequentially. You experience things as the time flows over time. Whereas when you re-narrativize, they tell a story about that, you have configured it in a particular way, given it a meaning, structured it in a certain sense, uh, discovered a coherence, 
and tell it in a way where it makes sense. That is usually in a narrative you have a beginning, you have a middle and a, you have an end. The beginning, middle and end, the way you structure and relate this defines the meaning of the events that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. Meaning of all the, the subplots that become part of that large meta plot. So therefore that beginning, end uh, and uh, middle is something which you or we, us as historians, are attributing to those events which have happened. So in this sense, experience time of the past is different from the narrative for time of the historian. And I'll have more to talk about time when we talk about Paul Ritter. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the act of con configuration that Mink is talking about, that the act the, the, that uh, historian's act of comprehension is the act of comprehension is the act of configuration and narrativization. And it is narratives which produced coherent meaning, uh, historical attribute, historical significance to the past, and uh, in a certain sense, give uh, meaning to that past. The, the meaning of the past does not inhere in the past. It does not reside in the past. It is not sedimented in the past. It's not embedded in the past. It is we who give meaning in the act of narrativizing, in the act of selecting events. You know, um, uh, 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 E.H. Carr had said it, that uh, writing history is an act of selection of events, and an act of selection which also is an act of forgetting. That is, when you select a certain, uh, certain sets of events, you in inevitably erase others and non-significant, because you're not selecting every event to write about. So the, the, the act of writing history is a, a process of selective appropriation of the past. Now that argument stated simply is, uh, 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 is an anti-positivist argument. What Mink, Paul Ricker and others have uh, tried to do is to demonstrate and to argue out, think through, deepen this argument. What is it to select? What is it to erase? That act of selection is not an arbitrary act of selection, it is an act what happened? Did you uh, try? Yes, the event is not there anyway. It's nowhere to be found. So I couldn't. Those air conditions are also not working. Don't, um, if you try the, uh, try a nail. The caretaker. And the, um, and the security person. Yeah. It's really hot here. Mm. So the act, act of, what is it uh, to select? That's the question we need to ask. When a historian selects, how do they, how do they select? We select through obviously certain criteria of selection. Now is that criteria already there in my mind, a filter through which we select? Or uh, where do we get that from? Uh, so uh, to select as we will see through the discussion today, to select is to operate through certain questions, pose certain questions, is to pose certain questions which actually flow from certain frameworks of thinking, certain paradigms of thought, overarching thinking, which we are often unconscious of. Historian is not always conscious of the fact that I am operating through these categories, but they operate. If you are deconstructing that historian's mind and thought and writing, then one can show that this person is operating through these assumptions. These are the questions you pose. You are not posing this question. If you pose this question, a different argument will emerge. If you uh, don't pose these questions, so a whole history is erased out. The, therefore, the different frames of reference, the different frameworks of thinking uh, make possible, open up uh, different kinds of w ways of posing questions. And the act of narrativization through those questions define the processes of selection and erasure within your story. That as I narrativize, certain questions crop up from my narrative, as I make sense. And those questions again I pose, and as I'm making sense of them, as the narrative develops, a whole set of other questions emerge. But in that act, there is no space for a whole range of other questions, a whole range of other uh, evidence and material. And those things get erased out, repressed, not thought about. So that's something which becomes part. And this, as I say this, I'm trying to, um, um, I should be emphasizing always that I'm not talking about deliberate manipulative history, of Stalinist history, uh, of fascist histories, of communal histories. 
there in those writing of history there is a, a a different order, a different mode of narrativization, structured by a different kind of politics, which one uh, thought about. Now, that is something which uh, is not, that I'm not taking uh, seriously in thinking about or arguing about this. This is the normal process uh, through which historians, no matter what their uh, frames of reference, they would be operating as, uh, in thinking and writing about history. Now, when um, uh, Hayden White, uh, when Louis Link was writing and developing, as I said, he was one of the earliest to uh, develop the argument and think about it. So he raised a whole range of uh, uh, issues, but he could not, uh, he did not develop um, um, th that uh, within his argument there was a set of problems. And he developed the arguments in a way. बाहर से भी ऑफ हो सकते हैं आप सिक्योरिटी से पूछिए और अनिल जी इसके पूछ मत हैं। He first of all in his argument as I as I said that there is a distinction between experience and comprehension. That history, the reality of the past is experienced in one way, sequentially. That's his argument. And comprehension is an act when you are trying to see things together which was experienced chronologically, sequentially, in seriatim. Things flowed like that. Now, can we really make this distinction? Very often these stark distinctions don't hold. Do we just experience time chronologically? And as I'll uh, suggest later, Paul Ricker to Carr, in that narrative reader, Carr says this, Paul Ricker develops the argument powerfully that we don't experience the world just spontaneously. We have structures of thought, we have cognitive uh, uh, structures within our mind, we have certain questions and uh, frames of reference, and we have certain categories of understanding through which we experience. And therefore everyone's experience of the world is not the same. Different generations experience the world uh, differently. At the same point of time, different people thinking differently experience the world differently. And as we very often, and that's the argument Paul Ricker develops, which I'll uh, talk about, that we, in the act of experiencing, actually develop plot structure. We, we live our life as very often narratives. Uh, and these are not, it's not as if that you have um, uh, chopped out that narrative and then you just simply live within it uh, uh, and act out that narrative. But there is a constant process, a dialogue between the narratives that we, uh, uh, we construct and the stories that we construct of ourselves, of our future, of our relationship to the world, about the world, a whole range of things, those narratives, those stories, which make us, uh, allow us to make sense of the world in particular ways, are stories which help us experience the world. Therefore, experience is not something outside the narrative, and narrative does not come afterwards. Experience is not something which is chronologically experienced. It comes chronologically, sequentially. It also has is structured. It also is, uh, in a certain sense, narrativized. The experience is not pure experience outside comprehension. Experience involves acts of cognition, comprehension, thinking out, making sense. If that is so, then this contrast between uh, seeing things together uh, and um, experiencing in chronologically is a problematic one. We are constantly see things together, make connections all the time to make sense of the world. If we did not, we will not be able to locate ourselves with the world and be at peace with the world. You know, the world will appear unfamiliar, incomprehensible. The fact that it becomes comprehensible in the act of our living that world is precisely because we are constantly trying to make sense of the world. <coughs> um, uh, Mink also, in developing his argument, uh, uh, did not really work out what he meant by narrative. What is this act of narrativization? If historical, uh, if narrative is a cognitive act, then we need to pose questions about what this narrative is. If the act of narration is so significant, then we must understand how does a historian narrativize. What is it that structures that narrative? If comprehension of the past or our return to the past or recovery of the past is so critically dependent on the way we narrativize, then unless we understand the processes, the practices through which narration happens, 
and uh, elements through which the narrative gets structured, we cannot really make sense of the past. So, uh, Hayden, uh, when we move on to Hayden White and Paul Ricker, we find a deeper theory of the narrative which informs their writing about history, you know, their thinking about history. Are there any questions on the link which before I go on to? Yeah. When you are trying to provide a critique of positivism from means perspective, uh, is this is this that that you are trying to say that when historians uh, start writing history, there is some kind of a priori assumption? Is he or uh, is he or me on this line, or is he using the hermeneutic interpretation, or 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 or, or both these things are the same? Because Generally, we have this uh, this very basic understanding of methodology, inductive methodology and deductive methodology, where we think that if we use deductive methodology, we already have hypothesis and we just go out to prove it. So, is he all being on design or is it much more complex than this? Yeah, uh, no, he is not going out, he is saying very categorically that historians do not simply have a hypothesis proposition which they go out to prove. But to the extent that Every act of thinking is structured through categories, terms, concepts through which we think. Then those concepts and categories through which we operate become critical in producing the truth or in structuring the comprehension, uh, 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 structuring the nature of our comprehension. So uh, what he's uh, suggesting is that every act of understanding and comprehension happens through a uh, 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 is filtered through, is structured through categories, terms and assumptions, but more than that, that this category, modes and assumptions uh, actually uh, in the act of that understanding, we are trying to connect, make sense of the past. And that act of narrativization, that, um, uh, the act of producing the story is the act through which comprehension comes. So it is in that sense, it's not that there is a, in a sense, there is a, uh, a set of a priorities which we all operate with. We all operate with a priorities, but the question is whether you con conceptualize the a priori as a priori or whether those are um, in a certain sense taken for granted a priorities. Different generations, different frames produce their own a priorities, ways, uh, categories and terms which we take for granted, through which we think we make sense of the world. It is uh, very often the, um, the doxa through which, uh, which in Bordeaux's term, it is the doxa through which we understand and relate to the world. Uh, it is uh, the set of categories and terms and uh, things that we take for granted in a society in operating, uh, in uh, making sense of that world. So it is, nobody can get away from a priori. But what are the kinds of a priorities you operate with is important. And when we are talking about historians, we have to actually discover the a priorities that the historian is operating with. And it is that discovery of the a priori, uh, that discovery of the categories and terms through which the uh, thinking happens, uh, that becomes an act of critical engagement with the writing of history. Hmm? So I don't think anybody can get away from a priori. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll move on to, um, sorry, yeah. Thank you. 
Therefore, as if to rewrite history is a problem. Now, uh, historians are constantly always rewriting. They are constantly, they, you, writing history is an act of rewriting. Con, con, making sense of the past is an act of continuous revision of our conception of the past. Now, therefore, there is no problem with revision or rewriting. What we need to analyze and understand, and that's uh, an argument I'm trying to make at the end of this Tuesday, is how do we make sense? What is, what is the truth that we produce through our act of configuration? Now, we need to understand that structure. Now, <coughs> it is true that uh, we need to equally understand the basic most of comprehension or um, uh, other kinds of popular structures of comprehension. And uh, historians have not always looked at that. Uh, but I try to limit my argument for this course to, that's why, history in a certain sense with capital H, uh, which is professional academic history writing, which is uh, which has been shaped over the last 20 to 200 years in particular ways. And how does academic history that and the traditions and patterns within academic debates within that, uh, that thinking and philosophizing within that. But having said that, we need to go beyond this. Not, not to say that this is the only way of relating to the past. What I am trying to argue is that this professional history has a particular mode of relating to the past. Even with all these differences, there are certain uh, tasks or certain modes of comprehension we take for granted, certain modes of authentication we take for granted, that's not a mode of authentication which is which a uh, mythic story takes for granted. They operate in completely different modes of authentication. We, we shouldn't neglect them, we shouldn't dismiss them as being you know, not history, therefore not to be taken. In fact, they are very powerful in shaping societies, politics of our time, shape, uh, you know, uh, transformations within society. And Therefore, we need to go beyond this to understand other structures of comprehension, which is very done nowadays, to understand how popular ways of thinking about the past actually produce certain types, certain types of, uh, a variety of types of comprehension, which you may critique uh, politically disagree with, but nevertheless you cannot neglect. They are extremely powerful. So, the caveat is only to uh, suggest that, uh, you know, somebody came up, I forget who, came up with a question at, at the end of the uh, discussion. <coughs> are you saying that it is simply a fabrication? Then how is, if we are arguing all this, if it is all a, a construction, how is this fabrication different from uh, a completely masculinist fabrication of the past or complete patriarchal or complete anti-dialist fabrication or com complete com communal or fascist or a fight in or uh, you know, a whole range of things. Uh, fabrications of the past, how do you uh, then re uh, differentiate between one fabrication? Uh, I could even use the word fabrication for this. History, a lot of, the, uh, there are books which say history is a fabrication, but fabrication in the, in, in a, uh, in the broadest sense of the term, that is to fabricate is uh, to produce a fabric. Uh, you know, you, to connect in a certain way. So construction and cons con uh, construction is also fabrication. But because fabrication has got uh, linked up with uh, the politics, uh, politics of Stalinism to politics of fascism, to therefore we don't always use the word fabrication. If you are using it ever, then it ha it has to be with a lot of caveats that this is not what I mean. So <coughs> that's why um, uh, I'm trying to suggest that. This, what we are discussing, uh, are practices of academic history writing within which there are debates and discussions. This is not the way other modes of making sense of the past proceed. Every return to the past is not history in the way that I am talking about. That is a way of relating to the past, producing a sense of the past, making uh, the past familiar in particular ways. But there can be different genres of return to the past. Is that, does it make clear? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, there are, uh, so I agree with No, that, no. Uh, I would agree that a lot of academic, good academic writings 
uh, uh, academic writings within the period, uh, within Stalinist, in the Stalinist period, will proceed on academic. But when I talked of Stalinist history writing, I meant uh, a particular kind of production of history, which is uh, uh, become associated with uh, falsification in a in a crude sense of the term. Now, uh, production of that kind of it. So, uh, selection of facts, as I said, is a normal, normal thing. But when you deliberately for, do it with a particular, then it becomes a different politics, a different kind of, a, uh, you know, which is not construction, but there has to be other kinds of categories. Kesseria and others have developed categories for it. How do you look at those things which have come to be called falsification? And therefore, <coughs> a lot of the limits of these kinds of arguments come up with, uh, um, are tested against certain kinds of uh, analysis of events to periods of history, which we might come to uh, later on. But it's, it's simply that, that if you read uh, a lot of communal histories, in that writing, I can give, uh, many of us have written on that, there, there are footnotes to 20 uh, books, none of the, 20 records, none of them exist. Now, that's a different kind of falsification. We are not talking about, it talks of uh, Akbar Nama, this, this page. The Akbar Nama doesn't have those number of pages. It says this, this kind of uh, document, this kind of uh, record exists, and this is the proof, and there is a quote from there. That, that thing doesn't exist at all. So now that level of, that's the crude level of things. We are not talking about that. Now, yet, what is interesting is, that they, in order to legitimate and authenticate, there is a footnote given. To, to make the reader believe that this is authentic, this is proof, this is evidence. And similarly, you have in, uh, in a lot of fascist histories to a lot of Stalinists. That Stalinist history has been analyzed a lot of histories from Pakistan. You know, the, uh, there is this book which calls Talks of Murder of History, in Pakistani book on Murder of History. Liberals and radicals have been writing which has nothing to do with the sources. You can read sources, represent, reorder, but as I'll try to suggest today, that historians have to deal with an archive. When you completely, uh, archives is also constructed, but you can't imagine things into existence when that source doesn't exist at all. So that's, that's why I'm trying to say that there is, we should see the difference between this and And it will become clear when we talk about uh, Paul Ricker and all. Could they come back to it later? Because we have to break just now. Um, so I'd like to um, talk of Hagen White. Okay. So, say for instance, you've also written uh, your article on the textbook writing in the textbook writing. So I'm just saying, say for instance, <coughs> that the, what you are trying to do, that in the name of writing professional history, you are just trying to extract or just trying to put your focus on how is the methodology. But your conclusion can be as flawed as the conclusion of the formula historian. Say for instance, unless there is a rise of subaltern, nationalist historians who are taken for the granted. Yes. So I am saying that, say for instance, that if you read a theory, you will find it, that you are trying to find out something and you are also uh, missing out some other thing. Being, you being a historian, suppose if I am if I'm K. Munti or I am a Makhalas, you say, look, your methodology is not correct. My methodology is very good. But what about the conclusion? What about the bigger question? Unless the Pesh Chakravarti and this is Pilag and this Subaltern they came, unless they demolish and unless they attack so nationalists, we took it for the granted for, 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 for uh, nationalist historiography because completely Bible for us. Yeah, no, that, that's okay, but that's, uh, that's what one is talking about. That is a paradigm, nationalist paradigm was hegemonic, it was accepted, it was taken for granted. Then there is an intervention, people make you see there are other questions, there are other histories, there are things which uh, the nationalists forgot about, they didn't focus on because they didn't have the question to. Then there is a critique of the meta-narrative of nationalist histories, which shows how narratives of nationalist narratives are produced. Statist histories, nationalist histories, uh, history from above, or uh, elitist histories, how they are structured. And that intervention, which makes you see how a nationalist history operates, also allows you to see what it excludes. That's the critical intervention we are talking about. Then they, there is this paradigm shift. What you are referring to is the paradigm shift we are talking about. That from the nationalist, you can go on to work anti-nationalist, anti-statist, and that is what one uh, is subaltern. Uh, uh, that is precisely way, with subaltern say, not just subaltern say, lots of people from the 80s and 90s began to pose new questions. And as you pose new questions, people different think differently. Of course, the earlier, the taken for granted world is the natural world you inhabit. 
So it is the Bible for you because the, nobody raised questions. Now that doesn't mean that the subaltern studies is the final truth. And I'll never claim that the histories, many of us have, 70, 80 of us have got together to write for the, the textbooks. This is the Bible or this is the final word on anything. It is that we have tried to pose a set of other kinds of questions, different from the way the nationalist histories of the earlier textbooks posed, which excluded a whole range of things, which excluded uh, stories about the people, their experiences, the uh, stories about the tribals or the peasants or the workers and others. It excluded stories about anything, uh, if you're talking about the economy, talked only about agriculture. It forgot that uh, there is a world beyond uh, peasant production, which is the paradigm through which you see the economy. There are the tribals, there are foresters, there are environments, there are hills, there are plains, there are rivers. Now, where are those histories? So, as you pose those questions, new histories open up. There are the women. There, there was no woman in the, except one or two, Rani Ki Jhansi and uh, um, Vijay Lakshmi. Nobody would c come up in that history earlier on. It was totally patriarchal, male, um, masculine history, where the experience of the people were male experiences. Now, once you begin to pose those questions, new questions emerge, new ways of thinking. Those are not the final truths. That's the argument. That none of these are final truths being spelt out. People, it raises questions and makes you think in slightly different ways. And the product, the historical imagination, whether in schools, colleges and outside, is, that's what I was trying to talk about, is a battle for imagination, of a historical imagination. It is not the truth, the final truth. It is one way of looking at the past, a set of questions which many of us feel was not posed by earlier. And that's the paradigm shift even in textbooks that some of us tried to make. That we need to have different kinds. Apart from the fact that there was uh, pedagogic issues involved. That is, the earlier textbooks, is just to make the, which flows from our kind of thinking now, earlier textbooks were written with the assumption that we know as a historian know the truth. I'm telling you that is how history happened. This is the way nationalists acted, this is history, this is colonialism. This. Now that is the meta story which produces the truth as authoritative, final, valid truth to be accepted by others and learned by others. What we are trying to suggest is that there are different ways of looking at the past and negotiating the different questions being put. And that implies that even pedagogically, the historian, the text or the teacher cannot claim that I, am, I know everything. I, we, I don't. There are other ways of negotiating those. So the, the writing of the textbook itself had to t change from being an authoritative purveyor of truth to a, a text which is more open-ended, which tries to raise questions and make people think slightly differently. So, if you say that um, <coughs> this poses as, a, uh, um, uh, it uh, offers a set of alternative truths, yes, to the, in the loosest sense, that every act of comprehension is an act of production of truth. But what we try to do is to subvert the notion that there, this is an absolute truth, that these are, there are other questions to be asked. There are many questions which we can't even think of because those questions haven't emerged. What the next generation, you know, you go from subalternism to critique of subaltern, post-colonial to critique of post-colonial, post-structuralism to critique of structuralism, uh, hermeneutics to critique of uh, hermeneutics, relativism to critique of relativism. So there is a constant, and this is not simply a fluid thing which is happening which makes no sense. That's how knowledge develops, through proofs and reputations, through conflicts and dialogues. And if knowledge is a production of uh, uh, is a process which is produced through dialogue, then that dialogue has to be nurtured, deepened, and made uh, uh, <coughs> and made the basis for production of knowledge and accepted as such. I think we'll break for five, ten minutes. <coughs> Thank you.
gives a meaning sense of experience. But the thing is, I think, uh, can actually someone know someone else's experience? No, no, really, I'll talk about it. We'll be talking about it, calling you. Hayden White and Paul Ricker. I'll see how much I can um, discuss within the frame of 45 minutes. Um, <clears throat> uh, like uh, Louis Mink, uh, Hayden White also goes on to develop an argument about uh, uh, narrative and history. Um, he uh, suggests, as uh, Louis Mink does and uh, Paul Ricker does subsequently, uh, that uh, the traditional opposition between history and uh, fiction is a false one. Um, his, the traditional distinction is one which where you see, uh, you assume that history deals with the real world and fiction with the imagined world. Um, now, this opposition almost uh, refers to history as referring to truth and fiction, very, by the very category, fic is, refers to the fictive reality. One is the real reality, the true reality, and another is the uh, fictive reality. So this almost, the, dif the difference is almost the uh, difference between the binary truth and falsehood, uh, real and fictive. Now, he argues uh, that uh, in every uh, account of the world, there is an element of poetry. Uh, there is an element of poetry in every account of the world, whether it is uh, his, history or whether it is uh, fiction, you cannot get away from poetry. Poetry in the sense that the poetic act of figuring things, poetry not in terms, in the narrower sense of writing poetry, but the poetic act is an act of figuration. And if you are using figurative language uh, to narrativize the past, then you the historian's act is similar to the act of the fiction writer. They also, fiction writers, use the language of, uh, use the figurative act, and uh, so does the historian use the figurative act. Now, the truth within history is not, he argues Hayden White, secondly, that truth within history is not defined by the content of what you say. Uh, 
like in fiction, um, even in history, the truth is defined by the form in which you actually tell the story, the structure through which you tell the story. And therefore, his book um, uh, is about form and the content, the, the content of the form. Now, the, the, the content, yeah, positivist history would assume it's the fact, it's the content which defines the truth of the past, the story that we tell. It is that which imposes on the historian and that's the story we tell. It is defined by those facts. And he goes on to argue that how we tell the story, what we tell, depends on the narrative structure within which we tell. So history, both fiction and history, seek to transform uh, the unfamiliar past or unfamiliar worlds, in the case of fiction, of the past and the present, and the unfamiliar past, in the case of historians, the unfamiliar is made familiar through the act of figuration, through the act of narration. And narrativization here, in both cases, fiction and poetry, in both cases, is an act of uh, uh, making sense. Uh, it does not matter, he writes, it does not matter whether the world is conceived to be real or only imagined. The manner of making sense of it is the same in both fiction or uh, uh, history. So there is a similarity between the acts of the fiction writer and the act of writing history. What we have both in fiction and history, thirdly, is uh, the significance of uh, the, the narrative structure. All narratives, have, a, as I've already mentioned, have a beginning, middle and an end. In fiction, you have a beginning, middle, and end, and that beginning, middle, and end structures the sense of the story which is told. Uh, how you end your story very often defines the entire meaning of the story, and how you begin your story often enters the, uh, the structure. So when we talk of a narrative structure, we often pose the question of how do you pose the questions at the beginning, how do you enter the story? and how you develop the story and how there is a closure at the end. What kind of closure? Do you close? Do you not close? And that act of closure defines the meaning that you are uh, intending to tell. So it does not come, the past does not come endowed with a coherence. It is this act of making sense through the beginning, middle and end, the narrative structure, which produces the coherence that the historian is telling, as well as the fiction writer is telling. So in both history and fiction, therefore, we have a similarity of uh, um, modes, uh, uh, modes of working, that is, the act of figuration, the act of narr narration, the act of making coherence. But he differentiates three forms of making sense, the three forms of comprehension that is there. He talks of one form as uh, the categorical form, um, that is, uh, you, in this form of comprehension, objects within society, what we intend to understand, our object of comprehension, these objects are seen as examples of a category. So if they belong to this category, a classificatory mode of knowledge, where you can have uh, six different classes and you fit things within those classes, as soon as it belongs to this class, you know that these, uh, um, a particular category of plants or species has ten uh, uh, a listing of ten kinds of plants under it. If you refer to that category, you know what that type is. If you refer to an animal of a particular category, you know what. In census, again, you have classifications where you're categorizing people into categories. As soon as you're, uh, as soon as we know the category, we know who you are almost. So the making sense of a person, of an object, of a thing, of a species, is here in the categorical mode of comprehension done through categorization of making uh, some, something, uh, making something, uh, of associating something with a category or listing something within a category. There is secondly, the theoretical mode of configuration, the theoretical mode of making sense. Within this uh, theoretical mode, he argues, uh, uh, objects that we try to understand, reality that we try to understand, or the past, that, uh, or the things that we try to understand, are seen as instances of uh, some general proposition, of generalization. Uh, so theoretical mode proceeds by uh, 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 establishing or discovering the law of a certain thing. The generalize uh, that there is a generalization, and you associate what you say or make sense of what you say in relation to that proposition, generalization, that law. And this he refers to as a theoretical mode. The third mode he talks of, and which is the most important for us, is the configurational mode, uh, where a set of instances, a set of events, or set of elements 
are all seen as parts of a complex network, of a complex structure. And it is by being seen as part of a structure that you uh, make sense of the thing. So the events, objects, things appear, uh, uh, become comprehensible by the act of configuring it, configuring them within a structure. So configuration is to connect them up within a narrative structure, within a structure to make sense of those elements. And he argues, suggest, uh, suggests, that these modes are irreducible. They are different paradigms. They are different ways of making sense. All valid, but different modes. And history is the classic mode of, the configurational mode, is the classic instance of the configurational mode of understanding. That we, in history, we are constantly configuring, narrating, structuring things in a way where we, through the act of comprehension, we write history, make sense of the past. So it is the paradigm case for him of the configurational mode. Uh, so historical understanding uh, comes to us, uh, dawns on us, when we actually make sense of a whole series of events as part of this complex network that we have, the coherence that we discover within history itself. So this is the act that he uh, refers to as that all, all these acts are acts of return, uh, uh, of making sense, but they are different types of acts. So he goes on to uh, suggest that uh, what happens in history uh, is that the act of understanding, of the act of uh, uh, narration here m means the transfer, and his po point I've already said, that, uh, that sequences, sequential uh, events, events which have a sequence, a sequential, sequentiality and chronology, uh, they, which unfold over time as a sequence, are reconfigured as a coherence. So the, the, the constitution of coherence or discovery of coherence is the transformation of sequence into coherence and that is the act of narration. And it is this uh, uh, and therefore history of the past is and this is the argument against positivism, history is not a sequence, it's not simple chronology. Not things which have happened one, uh, uh, within a sequential time, where time flows from one particular year to another particular. That was the notion of positivism. That you have to date things. Because that sequence is what gives meaning to what you say. Uh, when writing these textbooks that we are referred to, we face this problem. Of, because we have to relate to a world where teachers are used to making sense of things as a sequence. Now, if you move in your writing of history, if you move, not from that sequence, from past, from 1800 you come up to 1900, but you have taken a thematic thing. If you are trying to understand um, forest economies and tribes, why is it that you have to narrate everything which has happened from 1700 to 1900? It doesn't make sense. So you make sense of it by picking up themes through which you can understand that world. And therefore, maybe the sequence is one where you may have different kinds of sequences in different parts. So you may move from the present to the past, and then you move from the past to the present. It all depends how you sequentialize, how you configure would depend on what you're saying, how you're trying to make sense of it. There is no innate chronology given to the historian, which, is to be con which has to conform to a chronological uh, clock time. Now this created a lot of problems, because a lot of teachers couldn't make sense uh, initially. Some, they had some problems uh, that, you know, this disturbs our notion of what sequence is. You have to start from 1800, go on to 1950s. Now, uh, how is it that you start from 1860s and go back and then come forward? So we had to conform still, not to disturb the whole thing, we had to conform to a structure which doesn't disturb the teachers too much. So occasionally in some chapters we experimented with this, said that let them be disturbed so that they can think of other ways of thinking about the past, which is not purely sequential. But if you disturb them too much, then they'll uh, feel that you can't handle this knowledge, and therefore uh, th there will be a reaction to it. So uh, you have to find ways where the familiar, unfamiliar is made familiar, but the frames in which you are making familiar has to be familiar to the teacher. Uh, you may produce a whole set of new knowledge within a given, given frame, that will be seen as valid. But if you don't do that, if you uh, disturb the frame too much, then it becomes incomprehensible. So. Uh, this is something which always uh, poses, a, and this again I'll uh, uh, come back to when I talk of Rika, what is the notion of time in history then?
is it chronological? We'll talk of it when we talk of Brodel and his notion of time. What is time in history? Uh, so uh, what uh, Hayden White um, uh, argues is that uh, both history and uh, uh, literature, in a certain sense, uh, make sense on the past by making unfamiliar things familiar by attributing coherence to those things. But the difference between history, uh, but, but uh, the way to understand history, he argues, how does, he goes on to argue, unlike Mink, who also uh, agreed to many of these things, he goes on to argue that uh, while history is not merely chronicle of past events, is not merely sequence, the, uh, and that we have to go on to understand how the past is configured, uh, how the past is, uh, uh, coherence is attributed, he, he suggests that this attribution comes uh, the, the way we configure the world is defined by traditions within which we live. That is, the traditions that within which we live offers us certain styles of comprehension, certain tropes of comprehension, certain modes through which you comprehend the world. Uh, and what he means is that there are narrative structures which people are familiar with, which we are familiar with, within which we cast our stories. Um, so, Hayden White's uh, famous book, uh, meta narrative uh, is one which analyzes these tropes. He uh, analyzes these modes of comprehension and tropes of comprehension. Just to give an example, you can cast your story as a heroic story, and you can cast the same story as a tragic story. Um, give, to give an, one example, the national movement ends with a tragic story for Indian nationalism of partition. The language of partition is a language of pathos and tragedy. In the same story is retold in Pakistan as the triumphant story of the making of a nation. It is never, never in their story, it is not partition. Partition didn't happen. It is the making of Pakistan. All textbooks in Pakistan refer to making of Pakistan. And the making of Pakistan can't be tragic. Their very being, existence, ideas, territory, sovereignty, everything is defined by this. So Indian nationalism gives us a language in which we cannot comprehend that comprehension. That Pakistan, to talk of making of Pakistan is almost uh, of, uh, of Pakistan as a, a national movement is almost to be na anti-national in India. So again, in this story, when we uh, I'm going back to this uh, question of textbook because it was raised earlier, we tried uh, at one time, and it's a process which is going that we would write some text along with Pakistani historians. So some of us got together to uh, discuss and debate how this could be. And you come to know that we don't have the language of comprehending these two uh, experiences. That in, in, if you read the class 12 book uh, in uh, the school, with all our uh, critical ideas, we still use the language of partition. Now, if you use the language of partition, it doesn't make sense in Pakistan. You cannot teach that text in Pakistan. So what is the language in which you... So the, Every word you use becomes so important in comprehending the experience of a particular time. So what you have to invent new languages, new words, which break out of these paradigms and frames to capture the world and experience in completely different ways. So what, uh, uh, what uh, White suggests, uh, uh, as I said, that it can be heroic, it can be tragic, it can be ironic. You can write uh, stories in a way where uh, you both empathize with the people and the events and mark an ironic dis distance, uh, uh, distance from it by being uh, adopting the ironic mode. Um, in an article, I'd argued that Shumit Sarkar's writing is a good example of the ironic mode, where you write the Swadeshi story both through empathy and through distancing, which uh, by adopting the uh, uh, ironic mode uh, of uh, uh, constructing the story of partition. Now, in the uh, uh, nationalist histories, it is all heroic. Everything, it's a transcendent story of the peasants and the workers and the tribals, everyone coming together, everyone joins, the Congress leads one phase to another, you march forward, you this the triumph and story. Unfortunately, in the 40s, something happened and there is a partition. Uh, and uh, the communalists came and disrupted the, the triumphant march of nationalism, which still remains that triumphant march. And within that, there are certain types of actors. Who, those who are not part of this are all villains and evil. And you know, whether it's the Dalits or whether it's the, the left in 1942 or whether it's the you know, communalists, all are the evil figures who lurk around to disrupt this onward march of nationalism. Now that's the meta-story. And uh, uh, the 
story of colonialism is a simple story within nationalism, very often a simple story but of pathos, of tragedy, of decline, of dis uh, dismemberment of a nation, of a dismemberment of economy, agriculture declines, deindustrialization happens, industries don't develop, and what you have at the end is an understanding, the narrative structure is one which is, whose beginning and end is given. It begins with a, the, a good economy, tri thriving and um, productive, and then the middle is one of decline, and, and it ends with the uh, colonized economy, structured backwardness, thwarted development, stagnant economy, nothing moves. And af actually, if you query the figures, query the material, you find there's so many different things happen. It doesn't have space within that frame of narrative. You can write stories as Shakespeare's stories show that it can be comedies, it can be tragedies. They have tropes, they have structure. And if you structure a story within a mode, there is a followable story. You, people are used to those structures and they know how to make sense within those. Histories are written like that. And uh, he uh, shows how, uh, through the study of 19th century histories, how the tragic Marx, uh, from Marx to uh, Michelet to others, he shows how different overarching tropes of writing structure the meaning of the histories these historians produce. So uh, one can differ with those, but what he makes clear, what he tries to argue, is this, that sense-making is structured by tropes, modes of narration. And we need to understand those modes from. They are not just incidental, just, they, they don't just happen. There is a structuring process which is given by styles accepted within our tradition as styles of narration. You can uh, disrupt that, talk of alternative critical styles of fragmented stories, fragmented, but there will be a structure of that also. It's not something without a structure. So therefore, narrative structures define, tropes define the meaning of what is produced. Now that's how he goes on to argue uh, in a lot of um, in a lot of his essays that fiction that there is a thin line of difference between fiction and narrative. He can't spell it out, and that's one of the problems with his writing. He he can't spell out the difference between what is fiction and what is narrative, and that's what I'm going to argue uh, in uh, Paul Ricker. That is something which is developed at length. So history and poet, uh, he begins with history, uh, history and fiction both involved in the poetic figurative act, but he ends with an argument where the distinction between fiction and uh, history tends to dissolve. He struggles to make a difference, but can't really theorize that difference. And one of the uh, uh, places, uh, and that's why his articles have come up for a long debate on, on the Holocaust issues, uh, issue, the how do you represent the Holocaust? Uh, as a historian, there is a long debate which I have referred to in the readings, do read it. The limits of representation and argument about constructionism comes, uh, is tested there in a certain sense. So the narratives make, the structures of narrative make the past what they are, produce the meaning in the way, they, in the way that we understand it. Now that's, uh, that leads us to theories of plots, of structures, of tropes, of modes of representation. What we don't have here um, uh, is this argument, uh, is an argument about how, in what sense, uh, facts, um, uh, uh, the, the fiction and history, in what sense do they differ. And I'd uh, suggest and, uh, that uh, Paul Ricker is one philosopher who has uh, deeply thought about it and written three volumes of it, uh, is an attempt to see that line of distinction uh, between history and fiction, between uh, narratives of different orders. Uh, he uh, begins with, uh, by looking at the similarities, but talks of different modes of representation and breaks down the oppositions between history and fiction, reconstructs those oppositions, breaks them down again to reconstruct them again. Uh, so he's constantly uh, uh, moving from one level of uh, complexity to another level to a third level. Uh, so. We can't deal with all the levels uh, in discussion because it's a preliminary discussion. But I'll begin by saying what, what he sees as the similar and what he sees as the specificity of the historian's act. And that's what we need to understand. What is the historian doing? Which the fiction writer or imaginary um, novelist or uh, essayist is not doing. Like Hayden White um, and um, um, Louis Mink and other narrativists, Paul Ricker also sees a thin line of difference between history and, uh, it begins by saying that the traditional opposition, not thin line of difference, sorry, the traditional opposition between history and fiction can no longer be sustained. 
history doesn't refer just to the real uh, out there, a uh, truth. And fiction is not just all uh, uh, fictive, in, un, uh, untrue. In a sense. Both, in a certain sense, both history and fiction relate to the real. I'll make a set of propositions that he's trying to, and then try to. Both history and fiction relate to the real. It is not as if history relates to the real and fiction does not. Fiction also returns to the real. It tries to capture the real. Hmm. Both seek to grasp the experience of time. Experience which unfolds in time. Therefore, what is time within our experience? What is the experience of time that fiction writers and historians relate to? What is the time in what is the time that histor that we find in history? What is our notion of time? Both involve acts of figuration, comprehension, narrativization, refiguration. Both involve imagination. It's not as if historians write their histories without imagination, and fiction is the world of imagination. That's a traditional opposition. Because history is constrained by facts, you take out imagination, because imagination is subjective, it's prejudiced. It's now, that's not how fiction, uh, history is written. The finest histories are, the, uh, are wonderful acts of imagination. You have to bring the past, in, imagine the past, imagine events, imagine people acting, enter the past in a variety of ways to capture that past as experience in a certain sense. Uh, <clears throat> now, the thing is that while all, of, all both fiction and history uh, really are therefore in certain ways similar, yet they are different. And <clears throat> um, uh, his uh, um, three volume oeuvre is an attempt to understand that difference. What is the difference? Uh, I'll talk of three or four, quick, uh, quickly three or four points, uh, issues that he develops through the book. First he argues that we must understand the historian's uh, knowledge, the knowledge in history is based on the archive. This at one point might appear to be a positivist argument that history is written on the basis of an archive. Historians' knowledge is premised on the archive. You cannot get away from the archive. Um, if history, he argues, if history is a true narrative of the past, uh, documents constitute the ultimate means of proof. Without the document, you cannot write history. Uh, the, uh, the, these documents, uh, which, ultimate, which is the ultimate means of proof, they nourish the claim of history being based on fact. Why is it that historians can claim that my thing is based on fact? Because ultimately we have, we refer back to the document. That's what I mean by then the techniques of history. And that is the difference between mythic histories and the history with a capital H, that modernist histories we develop. There is certain mode of authentication, validation, uh, truth claims that we make through the writing of history. It's not just my account of the past. I return to the past through documents. History, therefore, he goes on to argue, the second point, uh, the first he argues that it is based on the document. If it is based on the document, what does history mean? He, means, he suggests that history is uh, to be understood as knowledge by trace. Documents are the traces of the past. The past that is gone by, which is no longer there, that once was, the past once was, that's how we think of it, that past leaves a trace. It leaves a trace in things, in doc documents in the most uh, open-ended song. It may be a text, it may be a paper, it may be a letter, it may be an inscription, it may be artifacts, whatever that trace is. So it's not document as textual document, but the past leaves a trace and we follow the trail through the trace to return to the past in order to comprehend the past. If this, that trail is lost, if we lose track of that trail, we cannot return to the past. The past that leaves no trace is erased from our memory. From a, a, we cannot return to that. Historians cannot make sense of the past or produce the conception of the past which leaves no trace. So uh, communities, groups, classes, people who leave no trace, their histories we cannot return to so easily. Very often we imagine that there are no traces. And as we go on searching, we may often discover traces which do exist. But in case that trace is not lost, if there are classes which leave a lot of trace, therefore historians are obsessed with the elites, with the state, with kings and queens, with the dominant groups, because they produce enormous amounts of documents. 
but inarticulate those who don't write, those who are not in power, whether it's the women or the, uh, the lower classes, whether it's the peasants or the uh, um, uh, you know, workers, or whether it's the foresters and the pastoralists or the mobile people and the uh, um, uh, um, uh, magic men or the beggars on the street or the vagrants, they leave, don't leave so many traces of them. They don't write the documents about how their own experience. How do we enter that? Sometimes if we search a lot, we do find and, uh, some traces. Therefore, history from below, which we we'll discuss, or subaltern histories and other kinds of histories which go beyond the elite's dominant uh, uh, frames of reference, have discovered lots of evidence. But very often they are the evidence produced by the state itself and is inscribed with the, with the marks of the state, their conceptions of the state. If he writes, and I quote him, <coughs> that if we lose the tra trail, if the traces are destroyed, the past would remain forever unknown. The activity of the people would remain hidden from us. That is, past which leaves no trace, produces no knowledge, of, uh, uh, erases, uh, if the past leaves no trace, that past is erased from our uh, history. Uh, <coughs> traces define, therefore, both the limits and possibilities of historical knowledge. In a sense, traces which when the traces, when you go to an archive and discover a document, it incites inquiry, it incites you to think about it. You know, suppose you go and you find something written by the vagrant or the beggar or a, 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 a poor woman or a prostitute, you suddenly makes you think and incites thought in the mind. Therefore, traces are incitement to thought. It opens up possibilities. It opens the possibility of return to a past which otherwise wouldn't exist simply by fiction writer can do it. You can imaginatively think of various things and uh, you are returning to the reality of the past, you are returning to that context, but within that context you have a play of imagination through which you can imagine the life of a prostitute or imagine the life of a um, um, uh, poor person or a beggar or a, you know, there are lots of his, uh, uh, stories which can be written about it. But you cannot do that as a historian. <coughs> the past and this, this document or a trace very often forces us to rethink our own assumptions, rethink the questions, pose new questions. Again, the trace has a dialogue with you. The document has a dialogue. It forces you to think. You don't shift the trace alone. It forces you to think anew in a certain sense. It opens up possibilities of imagination and opens up the voices of those who otherwise uh, you may not be able to hear uh, very simply from us. So these trails, these traces are very, very important. They point to the unknown. They point to a past which has already existed. And so these traces are not passive and inert. They are not for us only to interpret. I've been arguing till now, the historian constructs, historian constitutes. But there are limits and structures to that imagination. And if you think of history as a history through trace, it is knowledge by trace, as Paul Ricker says, then, and it is a knowledge premised on the archive, then the limits of the archive define certain limits to your knowledge. And the, the practices of historian become intimately connected to the dialogue you have with documents and archive. How you think of the archive, how you think of the document has to change. It is not a repository of hard facts of the past. The past is not just out there waiting for us to, be, to discover that. Uh, it's not there to be discovered alone. In the act of that discovery, we are making sense. But we cannot make sense if the trace is not there. So this is something uh, which we need to uh, think of. Secondly, going, moving from this, he goes on to argue that, uh, goes on to raise the question about uh, the reality of the past. What does, when we refer to the past, the reality of the past, what is this reality? What does the real really mean? Um, here he uh, argues that, and proceeding from the first argument about trace, he goes on to argue that historians' constructions are reconstructions. They are not simple constructions. Fiction writer may construct, but the historians are reconstructions. And he says, and I quote him again, through documents the critical and the critical examination of the documents, historians are subject to what once was. That is, you reconstruct from the traces. You reconstruct from the evidence. The there are uh, already constructions on those evidence. 
already the documents have been constructed. There is a construct implicit embedded structure within the archive. And in having that dialogue with evidence, what you're trying to do is to rethink them in new ways. Now, this act of rethinking, making coherent, is an act of uh, reconstruction. That is a historian, he argues powerfully, that owes a debt to the past. And this comes from his Christian, uh, a lot of Christian uh, writing and thinking, that he owes a debt to the past. The past is, demands an explanation, demands recognition from the present. The past, which is our, our uh, uh, fathers and grandfathers and their great grandfathers to others, they make a claim on us for understanding. And we owe that debt to the past. We have to return to the past to understand the past, to represent the past, to make sense of the past, for the present. <clears throat> uh, uh, and I quote again here, um, he says, historians, about historians, they owe debt, a debt to the past, a debt of recognition to the dead that makes them insolvent debtors. We as historians are insolvent debtors who have that debt because the past is there and gone by and it has happened, things have happened. It, it is not uh, just that the past w once was, which is to be dismissed, that once was, is the, the fact that the past is gone by means it once was. Not in the positivist sense, but we are returning to have, uh, understand something which has happened. How we understand it, what we under make sense of it, where do we, uh, uh, how we configure it is something dependent on a whole range of things. But for the historian, that past once was, that something has happened, that now needs to be recreated, means that it is no longer simply a construction, it is a reconstruction at the present. And he argues this through a notion of uh, representation, through a notion of time, and a, through a notion of um, um, narrative, uh, which I'll spell out in a minute. He talks of this return to the past as possible, uh, uh, that it is possible to return to the past in three ways. One is the Collingwoodian way. That is, you enter the past, you annul the difference Collingwood, uh, as Collingwood argued in Idea of History, that in order to understand the past, we have to enter the past. We have to enter that age, that time, and try and see how people experience the time. We have to try and understand what the world meant, what the vision was, what the event meant to the people, why they acted. We have to enter their mind. Now, what does this really mean? It means that you annul the distance between the past and the present. You transcend the present. The historian <coughs> actually transports himself or herself from the present into the past. You transcend the present, annul the distance between the past and the present, empathize with the past, enter the past, become part of the past. You can write about the past only when you become one with it. So the annihilation of or the uh, erasure of the temporal distance between the past and the present is central to the act of writing and understanding. That's the Collingwood argument. So here, <coughs> um, uh, Ricker says, this is the notion of a return to the past where the past appears in the sign of the same. The past appears as a sign of the same because I have, as a historian, uh, transported myself to the past and the present does not, should not in any way structure my imagination of the past. I annihilate the present. Ricker's argument is, can we annihilate the present? Can we enter that other world? Can we enter the other person's experience so easily? Uh, and as we think of representation, think of understanding, we'll find that we can try and understand, but we cannot so easily understand the other's experience outside the frames of reference that we have. So if the present defines our structure of understanding of each other, of other societies in the present, it equally un, uh, defines or even more powerfully defines our understanding of the past. How do we know the categories through which we understand the past? Where the categories through that past understood itself? Where are the categories? Where do we get the categories through which we understand the experience of a time as the experience of that time? We are recreating that experience. So that's the argument Ricker is moving towards. Can we understand the past? under the sign of the same. A second mode of understanding is the understanding of the past under the sign of the other. That is, a lot of historians uh, look at the past as different from the present, as another time, of a past which has gone back, gone, uh, um, already occurred, and the present which has evolved, moved, progressed beyond that past. 
So the categories through which you understand are categories which we'll discuss next time, for instance of the liberals and others, of cate uh, categories framed within a meta-history of progress. So from uh, primitivism to the uh, to developed society, uncivilized to civilized uh, society, barbarism to modernity, a whole range of categories which projects the past as the primitive other, as the, the, the prehistory of the civilization, as the other which we need to understand in contrast to the present. So you are rooted, historian is rooted in the present, deploys the categories of the present to see the other as the radical other and therefore it is an effort to return to the past under the sign of difference, not under the sign of the same which is the Collingwood mode, this is the under the sign of the other, under the sign of difference, that is you mark the difference between the present and the past. And third, he argues, and that's the argument he uh, uh, talks about as important, is understanding the past under the sign of the analogous, which is similar but not the same. That is, you transcend the present to become, uh, uh, to uh, enter the past, but uh, you cannot do so uh, so easily by dissociating from the present. So there is both empathy and distance. Historian has to enter, empathize, try and become other, but retain a certain distance. And that allows a dialogue between the past and the present, dialogue between different frames of reference, between my categories and other categories, between my experience and how that structures the questions I pose and the experience of another time, and recognizes that my recreation is a recreation of the present. It is not the past which is which has experienced in that way at that time through the categories and visions of the past at that time. So this is uh, uh, this means that the past is never reduplicated. The, the historian produces a narrative which does not reduplicate the uh, past in it. It refigures that past. It configures that past. And that configuration becomes an important thing. Therefore, what we produce as history is analogous to the past but not the same. It's similar but not the same. Analogous but not identical. It is uh, reconstruction, not simple construction, which is reduplication. This happens he argues, and then from this he moves on to a theory of implotment, where he argues that all this happens through the act of implotment. Implotment. Implot. P-L-O-T. Plotting. Implot. Uh, through the act of E-M-P-L-O-T. So to implot is to um, plot stories within a structure. Uh, uh, choose events, make connections, plot them together into a sense, into a comprehensible story, then you are implotting those events into the structure of the narrative. And the historian in writing the narrative is implotting events of the past into a comprehensible story. <clears throat> now this, he argues, is an active process. In, and he develops a critique of Hayden White, where he argues that Hayden White assumes that the existing st structures and tropes and modes and styles of narrative define the way we make sense. This is as if we are inert beings, subject to, the historians are inert, subject to the styles of the time, structures and modes through which you can comprehend. What he argues is there is a dynamic uh, relationship between the historian, the material, the tropes of analysis, where everything refigures everything else in a, a variety of ways. And he develops <coughs> Through this critique of White, he uh, develops an argument that, yes, we need to understand the tropes and structures and styles as heritage, which tends to shape us. But we must understand, but we as historians actually rework those styles in the act of implotting stories. So uh, encoding, implotting, the way we uh, do, this, uh, do this in the act of narration and history produces the meaning. But in this act of uh, narrativization, what we do is uh, do uh, two, three different things. That is, first, <coughs> we must recognize that the plot that a historian refers back to has a plot structure of its own. Because it has once happened. It has gone by. The past is no longer there. It had a plot which made a sense to the people of the past in particular ways. And that plot, a variety of people, not one sense, but different people made different senses of it. Now that plot structure is not available to us in its, uh, uh, you know, we can't return to that so easily. 
what we are doing is to return to those plot structure and re-plotting those into new narratives. So there is a difference between, uh, uh, there is a process of discovering the plot structures which others may have plotted. The experiences, as I mentioned earlier, experiences don't come chronologically, sequentially alone. They are being plotted all the time. We live our lives as a tale that is told. There is a famous book by a South African historian uh, who looks at uh, mythic stories and oral traditions and talks of how these oral traditions shape the life that people live. So uh, if we live our life like, uh, like a tale that is told through the narratives of the present, through the structures of cognition that we have, then in a certain sense, those plots of the past are re-implotted today to make, make sense. Now, um, make sense of, um, uh, now therefore there were intentions, visions, actions which happened, which we can only rethink and refigure in some sense, but which cannot fully define what we plot. What, how we plot it depends on our act of plotting and the evidence that comes from it. So there is a, what happens here is a dialogue between two processes, which he is looking at very carefully. And uh, this dialogue is between what he refers to as sedimentation on the one hand and innovation. The past sediments, the styles and tropes sediment certain structures which are already there. Now this process of sedimentation is not what governs everything. That's important, but it is also, there is a process of innovation in which the historian or the act of configuring, the, the person who is configuring is involved. Now, there is an act of innovation. So, what is sedimented is restructured also. There is a um, dialogue between an active relationship between the past and the present. The past imposes itself through the documents, through the trail, through the trail, through the traces. But the past is refigured in the way that we refigure the past in through the configurational act. So the past is not simply there imposing itself on us through the documents. If we understand the past through the documents, then those documents take us back to the past, but the past is reconfigured. So the relationship between the past and the present becomes a dialogic one, becomes a active dynamic one where the past imposes certain limits to understanding, opens up certain limits, but the present returns to the past to configure and narrativize the past, but reinvents the past in new ways, reworks the past in new ways. This process of reworking implies the past and present in the act of the historian's imagination has an active dialogue where the past is both, the past both governs, but is re reworked. Uh, the present returns to the past by seeking to transcend the present, but also reworks the past through the present, through the categories of the present. This implies for him uh, a process of temporalization, and I'll end with that, that a process of temporalization and a process of co uh, cognition and configuration, which he schematizes into three stages. <coughs> he says that Historian returns to the past that once was. And this, for the historian, is the prefigured past, before the act of configuration. When we look at the trail, when we look at the document, when we look at the archive and the sources, we seek through those trails and traces to return to the prefigured past. That is, prefigured in the sense that it comes prior to my act of figuration, my act of configuration. So this prefigured past is reconfigured through the act of the historian's uh, narrative act where cognition, representation, narrativization happens. And this this, through this process of writing history, which is the configurational act, which is the act of narrativization, the prefigured past is reproduced not as the same, but as a reconfigured past, as part of the story and the narrative that is told. So you have the prefigured past, which defines the constraints of the historian, which demands from the historian a recognition, which poses, which, uh, de uh, which is the debt that the historian uh, owes to the past. You return to the prefigured past, but through the act of reconfiguration, you reconfigure it into a reconfigured past. And the narrative of the historian produces a reconfigured past as a story. It is not the same as the past. This means, in terms of time, and there is a uh, uh, 
um, meditation on time in Paul Ricoeur's argument, it means the past which appears in the history book as a past, the time which appears past as a time, as a temporality which appears in the history book as a past, is not the time of the past. And there he again uh, uh, talks of three levels. Uh, that is, there is a prefigured time, that a time which was once, to which the historian is subject to which we return to through the trail, through the archives, through the documents, through the evidence. This prefigured time which is already gone, which we can try and understand, but which is no longer there. Precisely because of that, this prefigured time precedes us, our act of comprehension of history writing, our act of return, uh, through the, going to the archives, discovering the traces through which we... This prefigured time, through the act of narration or reconfiguration is produced as the reconfigured time of the history that we produce. So reconfigured time has a relationship to the prefigured time to the extent that the prefigured what has happened is now configured as the history, the time that we return to. But without that we could not configure. If the trails did not exist to lead us to the prefigured time we can't configure it again. And But the configured time is not the same as prefigured. You can see here that he is powerfully critiquing the positivist. That is, in the positivist argument, the reconfigured time, so-called reconfigured, the historian's time is the same as the time of the past. Uh, the, uh, the present, the, what we produce as history is the same reality of the past. What he is saying, there is a critical mediation here, which is the act of reconfiguration, which reconfigures time, which reconfigures the past, which reconfigures reality. And through this refiguration, there is a new reality produced in it. But the difference between this and uh, if this is different from positivism, it is equally different from powerful relativism of, of um, um, uh, constructionist uh, uh, of the hidden white type, where you can't see the difference between fa fiction and history. This argues very that the historian's imagination, figuration is structured, shaped, limited by the archive by the document, by the possibility of a trace leading back to the past, by the trails which may be lost and not lost, pasts which will be erased and may not be erased. Now this return and limit which the archive produces is something which defines the craft of the historian and the art of the historian. We are powerfully shaped by the trace, uh, by, the, uh, by the limits of the archives, but we are, that limit does not impose itself on us because Configuration is a creative act of rethinking that evidence trace and the past in innovative ways to produce a new reality that we are talking about. What does it mean? What, what are the structures within which we do it? How do we do it? Are uh, things which we can uh, analyze through tropes and uh, analysis and structures and frames and paradigms. How do we critique that? We can structure it. But the craft involved there is in craft or art involved there is a art of figuration, the poetic act of figuring the past, where past is transformed into the present of history, when configuration is trans uh, configuration and act produces a new meaning through the act of refiguration.